So we're going to go on a series now about the Holy Spirit, go a little bit more into the Holy Spirit, how he works, how he flows, um, how he wants to be involved in our life, uh, to allow that power to flow through us and see how real it is. I, I hope and pray that you'll see how powerful that is and how God wants to use us in a huge way. Again, you got very limited notes today. This is like almost four pages of notes. Um, and in, in the four pages of notes, there's 17 scripture reference. And what you have, there's only four. So I, I'm going to read a lot of this because I don't want to lose anything in this. And I, I think it's a very powerful testimony that I like to give. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. It gives other people courage and hope to see that God is real. Uh, that we can look to him, that we can depend on him. So today we're going to talk about hearing the voice, hearing the, the voice of, of God, of the Holy Spirit. And there's different ways that, that God will talk to us. Um, he'll, he'll talk to us, you know, directly into our spirit. Um, there are accounts of people actually hearing an audible voice, his audible voice, not just in their spirit. Talks to us through angels, uh, through visions, through dreams, through the scripture, um, even uh, sometimes through situations uh, and confirmation and things that we're praying that God will show us in the things around us. Like when Gideon prayed for the fleece, for it to be, you know, the cotton fleece to be uh, wet from dew or, or dry from dew both times. So, you know, that, that's how the Lord kind of answered and spoke to him. So there's all these different ways that we can hear from the Lord. And it's so important. And God warns us not to um, lock out his voice. In Hebrews 3, 7 through 15, just going to read part of this. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. So apparently here, when the author of Hebrew wrote this, um, he's saying, look, uh, obviously you can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, and the warning is, don't harden your heart from that voice. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold on to the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So apparently, we can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in our heart. So, there's, you know, and there's, there's, there's a battle against the kingdom of God, and it's coming from within the church. And we'll address this through this series on the Holy Spirit because... It's sad that there's, there, there are Christians that are, are really pushing against what the Holy Spirit is doing and what, the, what I believe the Scripture says. Um, there are cessationists that claim you, you can't hear God's voice. Um, that, you know, you can read Scripture and you can see it in Scripture, but, boy, really trying to say that you can hear God's voice, you're kind of like, woohoo out there. Um, there. There was a friend of mine who... Um, Another friend of mine, who was a very good friend of mine, worked with and um, invited him to this church, and he came, and he, he was in the world. He wasn't born again. He'll tell you that. And, and this guy got born again, and he got on board and saw things scripturally the way we did and was all excited and was helping out in ministry here and became a big part. And then he heard of a guest speaker coming to a church in Port Huron. And um, the, he knew the guy's name, too. The guy was a... a, a a Christian, and he was, you know, a football player and had a very well-established ministry. Um, well, at, at that time when he spoke, he, he, he's a cessationist, which basically uh, comes against the, the gifts, the movement, the, the flow of the Holy Spirit. And, and he said some things that this, this new, newer Christian didn't understand. He'd been a Christian for several years at this point. And he went up and he talked to him at the end, and he, he said, some things I don't understand, and he said, you know, and I feel I hear the voice of the Lord, and he says, well, if you think you hear the voice of the Lord, you better check yourself into a loony bin. And, it, and from that point on, it changed him. And then he started to listening to other people in that line of thinking, and then eventually grew apart from who we are and left. And I, I'm not even sure what he's doing now. I mean, he's still saved, I'm sure. I don't doubt that he's saved, not one bit. But is he walking in the victory that he could be walking in through the power of the Holy Spirit? I don't know. I, I, I would have to question that. 
I want to give a testimony. You've heard this before, but I'm going to try to be a little bit more articulate in explaining how God worked. Nine years ago today, to this very day, to today, May 30th, in 2012, I was miraculously healed when the neurosurgeons proclaimed at the University of Michigan, it's a miracle. They don't use that term. In fact, after they had said that, and I was in the recovery room, and we were talking about that, and my wife said, well, the doctor said it was a miracle. A nurse standing there overheard that. And she said, uh, excuse me, did you say the doctor said it was a miracle? And she said, yes. And that nurse said, they don't use that term here. And then my, da my daughter, who's a physician's assistant, was there the whole time with my wife, and she looked and she said, uh, yeah, they use that term. I had a very serious issue called arterial venous malformation. And today I celebrate the goodness of Father God testifying here before you. I was supposed to die if at best be a vegetable. That would be very, very limited in my talking and my thinking. The Holy Spirit will come to us and tell us things. And one of the reasons why I was able to hold on through this and have hope through this, now there are times where I was a little afraid when I was going through this, when I came down with this. And, and I knew, though, I believed in prophecy. I believed in what the Holy Spirit told me. And, and he promised me of some things and even showed me that this was going to come. And I'm going to show you that. And in that, it gave me strength to make it through and believe that, no, no matter what, I'm coming out of, out of these hospitals. I'm going to come out healed. I went to three different hospitals in this journey. It was a little over 40 days. In John 3, uh, 16, 13 through 16, it says, however, this is, this is Jesus talking to us. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak to you. And he will tell you things to come. Hmm. He's going to tell you things to come. Why? To prepare you, to strengthen you, to build your faith. He will glorify me, for he'll take what is mine and declare it to you. All these things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take a what is mine and declare it to you. If you can't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, how are you going to be able to be led by the Spirit of God? God is so good. In, in September of 2011, um, that's when this edition was completed. And Karen and I were still full-time teachers at the Santa Lac Career Center. And we had been praying about um, when it's time. We wanted to be full-time here because it was really hectic. We're still trying to raise a family. That job was very demanding, not only being a teacher, but uh, running the, the food service program and, and culinary arts, like running a business and teaching at the same time. And Plus, I was still in college still taking college class. It was very, very hectic, and then trying to run this church. And so we were praying to God, also, when it's time to step into ministry full-time here, um, is it going to be just me coming, and, and then Karen stay working just to stabilize our finances, or is it going to be we're both going to come out at one time? And, 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 and the Lord put it on my heart and showed me some things. He said, but, but before you come out, before you come out, he made this very clear to me. He said, that the enemy has one more major stumbling block that he's going to throw at you before you come out. And he highlighted the term to me, major. And I told Karen, I said, Karen, I said, before we come out full time, I said, we're going to have a battle. God made it really clear to me that there's a major stumbling block that's coming. And I don't know what it is. I thought a church split. Um, I thought maybe Karen's health because Karen... Her, she seemed to battle health issues more than I did. Um, I, I just didn't know what it was. Something with our, our, our daughter who was in the Marines. I, I, I don't know, but I knew something major, so we were trying to be prayed up so we wouldn't let our guard down. And then a couple of months after that, I, I, I heard the Holy Spirit put on my heart to give me some hope. He said, coming up this summer, he said, you're going to have unspeakable joy. And he said, I'm going to make all things new. And then he said, I'm going to bring you and Karen out of the career center together. 
And I write these things down. And I tell people. It's not like I wait for it to happen. And then say, oh, by the way. So, on April 16th, 2012, the major stumbling block happened. Over the past few months, I had some strange symptoms that would indicate something's wrong with me, with my, with my thinking and, and how I felt, and basically symptoms of a stroke. And even when I was preaching on Easter Sunday, I could feel it starting to overwhelm me, and I felt, and I'm, I'm praying underneath my breath, okay, I'm going to get through this, I'm not stopping, I'm not stopping, I'm getting through this Easter service, and still preaching and making it through and feeling a little dizzy and woozy, and my brain's feeling weird, and and when I was done, one of the leaders in our church came up to me and said, you were having a hard time, and I was praying for you. I don't know what it is, but there's something going on. I said, yeah, I know. And so here, this is a week later on Monday, and I'm feeling really bad in the morning. I'm having Karen pray for me, and I'd feel, I'd feel better. Then I'd feel bad. Then I'd, she'd pray for me. I'd feel better. I still go into school that day at the career center, and I, there's a pastor that worked there. I said, hey, pray for me, man. I'm, and and these, these symptoms were feeling worse and they were increasing and and so I, I call my doctor I explain it to him he says you're probably having a stroke he says you need to get in the hospital right now and I felt well if I gotta go to the hospital with anything having to do with the stroke it means I might be a gone for a while and and I know Karen's got to still run the class and I better get some things done and it's Monday and I need to do ordering for Gordon's and so I hang out there and I try to get a bunch of stuff done like a, a typical idiot man that should listen to the voice of his doctor and go in, but no, in my own stubborn stupidness, you know, I could have plopped down right there. And then I decided to drive myself. And uh, so about three o'clock, I left a little early. I left, I left a half hour early, so I got some credit here, okay? I left a half hour before I was supposed to get off, you know, my, my day. And I drove to Marlette Hospital, I went into Marlette Hospital, and uh, right away, they, uh, Karen finally came to. She, got, she was there maybe 20 minutes, half hour later. She had to finish up some things there at the career center. And then she come and they, they did, I don't know if it was CAT scans or whatever, they looked at my brain and they said, yep, your brain's bleeding. Um, you, you need to go to St. Mary's. That's where we would recommend that you go. There's one of the best brain surgeons in Michigan there, Dr. Field, um, and that's probably your best place to go. So they put me in an ENT, and I'm, I'm off. And I remember on my back, laying on that gurney, you know, going, going down M46 thinking, hmm, so is this that major stumbling block, Lord? And that's what I felt in my heart, that this is probably it. I never suspected it would be my health because I always was the one that was working out and that was in basically good health. So I, I arrive at St. Mary's Hospital and after three days of test, testing me with every kind of test you could imagine, Dr. Field, the head neurosurgeon and, and Dr. Godot, his assistant, said my brain has been bleeding and then stopped and then bleeding and then stopped. And they said, that normally doesn't happen. Normally when it starts to bleed, you've got issues. And I think I could remember every time that I would feel this coming on and we would pray and it would stop. And I thought, I wonder if that's what was happening. And then he told me that my situation is very serious. He used words like inoperable, rare, extreme, hard to get to, very complex, and so on. Blood had pooled by my pituitary gland, and blood was flowing in the wrong directions, in my veins and in my arteries, and they were a mess. It was a very complicated issue that was going on in my brain called arterial venous malformation or fistula. They said I probably could have had it since birth, but they weren't sure. And they said probably some kind of trauma to your brain has, has activated this. And he said, it's going to take an entire team of surgeons to go into your head at one time to try to fix what's going on in your brain. And he said, if I were you, I would try to go to the Burroughs Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. But my insurance company wouldn't fly me there because just the plane trip alone was over 15 grand. And they said, you have to go to another major hospital first to get denied that they can't help you, and then we'll think about getting you to Arizona so the doctor field recommended to me, he said, I know an associate, Dr. Thompson, at U of M. And he said, I want you to go to U of M and check them out. So he made a call for me. They said, yep, we'll look at them, send them down. And so I go to U of M hospital, and I, I remember thinking going down there that, 
okay, Lord, if, if this is the hospital that they're going to work on me, great. Or if I got to go to Phoenix, great, whatever. But all I know is I'm leaving the hospital healed because you got plans for me. And you told me that this was coming. And so it's not going to stop me. So I'm not afraid of any operation, but boy, I sure like you just to heal it. Didn't want to go through the operation thing. So I go to, at U of M, and the doctor there said, yes, I think I can help you. Dr. Thompson said, I actually trained at the Burroughs Institute. And he said, um, I have more modern understanding, even techniques, than what they have, are using now. He said, I think we can help you here. He said, but I, I, I want to go in, and I want to look at your brain for myself. So they go in, they look at my brain, and then they come back to me, and they say, we got some good news and some bad news. I said, well... What's the good news? Well, we got some great pictures. We really understand what's going on in your brain. I said, what's the bad news? He said, it's worse than we thought. I thought, oh, great. You mean, so you really just got bad news. <laughs> you know, and he said, well, I want to assemble my best team of surgeons. He goes, I got three very good uh, uh, neurosurgeons. I, I, I want to assemble them all together. So we're going to set up a date. It's going to be May 30th. And then we'll all go, well, my team will go in and, and we'll try to see what we can do. Uh, to stop the bleeding, and, 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 cause, which is pretty much stop, but he said the pooling that you have by your pituitary gland, and why is it doing all these different, you know, we're going to see what we can do here. Great. So on that, on that day when, when May, May 30th came, um, I was uh, kind of excited but nervous, and they had so many portals into my body. I was hooked up. I don't know. I, I think I had seven or eight portals. I mean, both growings arms, I mean, everywhere, everything you could think of, they had things, wires and tubes going into my body. And I remember the anesthesiologist coming up to me when I'm on the gurney. And he, and he referred to Daniel, and he said, Mike, he said, I, I never knew this guy, it's the first time I saw him. And he said, Mike, I've been praying for you last night. And he said, even though they throw you into the fiery furnace like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I know that you, you're always going to serve the Lord no matter what happens, no matter what the outcome. I'm like, okay, great. So, and that was one of the last things I heard, and then I was out. And then it seemed like a real short time had passed. And then I remember kind of waking up, and I got my eyes closed still, and I can sense that I'm moving, and I feel I'm still on the gurney. And I heard, I heard somebody say, how do you do? How did the guy turn out? Because it was a big talk. This was complicated. This was, you know, all the big shots. This was, we, we haven't seen something like this and experimental and all these terms. And, and then I heard the guy pushing the gurney, who was my anesthesiologist, and he said, he's doing great. He's healed. And, and, and I, I, I heard that he's healed. And I'm like, what? And, and he must have... Noticed that I, I, I startled a little bit or I jumped a little bit. And he said, he said, Mike, you're healed. And right then, a rush of joy. I mean, this joy just, whoa, whoosh, all through my body. And I'm still closed. I'm still intubated. And, uh, you know, and, and my eyes, and, and, and just tears are just streaming down this overwhelming joy. And I remember when God said, you're going to have unspeakable joy. I didn't know it was going to be literal because I couldn't speak because I still had the tube in my throat. Talk about being literal and figurative. And so I'm, I'm thinking, man, I, praise you, Lord. I'm, I'm on my back. I'm starting to lift my hands up. Praise you, Lord. And then I heard somebody yell, what's he doing? What's he doing? And my, the anesthesiologist said, I know what he's doing. And he tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, he said Mike, he said, don't praise God now. Put your hands down put my hands back down and at some point in this I remember when they when they took the the tube out and I took a deep breath and they said take a deep breath I felt I sucked the whole room in every bit of oxygen out of that room and he said exhale and they they take this out and in the meantime with my wife um, they 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 gave her a, a buzzer and they said it could be a five-hour surgery so they said if if he has a stroke they were worried about possibly could be a stroke and they said, um, if there's any complications, we're going to call you in, so don't leave. Try to be here um, in case they have to make some decisions. Um, and they, they couldn't keep me out longer than five hours because of all the chemicals and everything that they're using are, are just too dangerous. So I was only in surgery for about an hour, and the buzzer goes off. And my wife and my oldest daughter, Shawnee, the physician's assistant, they were... 
uh, outside on a break, taking a break. And my younger daughter, I, I can't remember, I think uh, Gracie was probably about 17 at the time. She had the buzzer, and all of a sudden, it's only an hour in, and the buzzer's going, brr, brr, and she's like, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, where's mom and dad? Yeah, or, or where's dad, or where's mom? I got to get mom. And so they, they meet up, and, and they, they get Shawnee and, and uh, Karen, and uh, they start rushing back to surgery, and they see two of the uh, neurolog neurological surgeons standing there, and they had a little bit of a smile on their face, and they said, he's healed, isn't he? He's healed. We've been praying for a miracle. And they said, well, let's go into the room and talk. They go in a little private room. They start talking, and, and Karen goes, he's, he's, he's healed, isn't he? We were praying for a miracle. And, and they said, well, yeah, we believe it's a miracle because we didn't do anything. We got into his head. We didn't say anything wrong. Everything was rewired. There was no sign of anything that had been there before. Now, they got pictures of my brain before and after. And they said there were places where there weren't even veins where there are now veins. Behind my sinuses, I didn't, there were two veins that never showed up in any of these times that they were in my brain in the pictures, and now they're there, and now they're functioning, and there's no blood pooling, and everything is perfectly rewired in my brain, and they didn't know what to say. And that's why they said, well, we, we, we could have only been in there for 15 minutes, but we wanted to keep them knocked out so we could really look around, so we took an hour to look through his whole brain. He's fine. And Karen's all excited, and she says, well, did you tell my husband? And they said, well, yeah, we told him uh, when he was in recovery, but they don't remember when they're in recovery. He's not going to remember. And she said, oh, yeah, if you told my husband, he's going to remember. <laughs> yeah, and I did. And um, she said, well, um, when do you want, you want him to come back, like in a couple of weeks for a checkup? And they said, you don't understand. You don't have to come back. His brain is 100% normal. She said, well, can I bring him home tomorrow when he recovers? And they said, you can bring him home in a couple hours. And she's like, well, what are the chances of this happening again? And they said, about the same chance as it happening to you. And she was all excited and God is so good. And, you know, I, and so I, you know, and I just, you know, and Karen was my strong tower through this. Karen kept it together, at least while she was in front of me. She waited to cry until she got in the parking lot because this, this was a 40 day journey, three different hospitals. She was my strong tower. She was amazing. She was my hero. She was by my side. She wouldn't leave me. She'd go home, get a little sleep, and then come back in. And her faith just kept up. It was just amazing. And so everything that, that the Lord had prophesied to me came to pass because that day when I left and Karen came to be with me, basically was our last day at the Sandlack Career Center, and the Lord took us out of the Career Center together, just like he said. What kept me going through that was the promise from God that he said, you're going to go through a major event. The enemy's going to throw a major stumbling block, but I've got unspeakable joy. I've got good things are coming. Hold on. So in other words, I wouldn't quit believing because of that prophetic word of what he gave me. Now I have all these scriptures about, about hearing the voice of God that you don't have. I can go on and on and on and, and say all these things, but I want to give you the same example. Paul went through this same thing. So I'm going to go to some scripts at the end of, my, of, of what I have written down there. I don't have time to go through them all. And it says in Acts 23, 11 through 13, but the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, by Paul. Here's the Lord talking to him, okay? <laughs> Jesus is already, he's in heaven, right? He was already crucified, okay? He rose again, he's in heaven. We're, we're talking now, we're getting towards the end of the book of Acts. But the following night, the, Lo the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. Wow! I mean, come on, talk about getting nervous. I mean, here's some crazy zealot, and they have been known to kill people. Forty of them banded together, took an oath, said, we're not going to eat or drink until we kill Paul. 
Because he's out there talking all the time about this Jesus stuff, and he's a radical, and we need to kill him. Okay? The Lord knew of this. And he told Paul, though, be of good cheer, because you're going to testify and bear witness to me in Rome. So what did that do? That gave Paul courage, knowing that regardless of what these guys say, I'm going to make it to Rome. Because they didn't want to let him out of Jerusalem. They, they were going to kill him before he got out of Jerusalem. Guess what? He got out. Because what? He heard the voice of the Lord prophesy to him and give him a promise. And so he knew that this was going to be okay. And then something else happened in, in which it was a circumstance, and the circumstance didn't look good. In fact, the circumstance looked like they were going to be doomed. But Paul remembered the promises from the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Acts 27, 22 through 26. And now I urge you to take heart. Now this is when they were in the ship. And they were sailing and Paul warned them not to go and they were taking Paul on the journey as he's going closer and closer to get to Rome. And, and they told him, you know, Paul warned them, you know, this, this is not a good time of year to set out, but they, they set out. And they're in a storm and they're in a tempest and it looks like they're going to lose everything and they're not sure what to do and they're all afraid. And it says, and now I urge you, take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all these all the lives of those who are sailing with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe that God, that it will be just as he told me. And the ship got smashed apart. Nobody died. They were by an island. And they all swam to shore and everybody lived. The prophecies that God gives you to hold on and have faith are not only just for you, but it's to save those around you. So when all hell breaks loose, you're like, no, no, no. I know the end of the story. My God is good, and he loves me, and he cares about us, and he's got a plan, and we're going through this storm. That's why the Holy Spirit talks to you. That's why you hear his voice. And so people who say, these cessationists who say, you can't hear that, I disagree. And I testify of the goodness of God. You know, just like my friend heard, you can't hear the voice of God. And it changed him. Poison got in. He started listening to that doctrine. And I want to know, we got to be careful, how many times have we heard something that is contrary to what we believe, but yet a seed gets in. <laughs> 